Welcome. So uh, my name is Eric Peskin, and I'm in the Center for Health Informatics and Bioinformatics. And within that, I'm in the High Performance Computing Facility. And basically what we do in the High Performance Computing Facility is we run a cluster of Linux machines and mass storage that's used by various bioinformaticians and other researchers around the medical center. Um, so if you have computing needs, whether they're reconfigurable computing needs or not, uh, I would recommend you contact us. Okay. And so with this talk, so my, my research specialty, at least in my prior life, uh, before joining here, um, when I was, a, I was teaching at the Rochester Institute of Technology, and uh, my research focus there was reconfigurable computing, which is a field that kind of blends hardware and software. And my goal with this talk is not so much to tell you about cool research that I've done, although I do refer here and there to a couple of projects that I was on, uh, but more I'm trying to give a, a taste of what reconfigurable computing is, uh, what it can be good for, and what we're up against if trying to realize that potential for what it could be good, good for. Uh, and sort of a review, uh, just a, a taste of some applications toward that end. Okay. So, all right, so what problem are we trying to solve anyway? Uh, basically, here's the problem. Say you've got some application and uh, you want, you've got an algorithm for your favorite application. So you have some way of solving this problem, but the question is how do you implement this algorithm? And there are many possibilities, but at least two possibilities at a couple of extremes are you could implement this application in software. You could write a program in your favorite programming language and run it on a standard computer or a cluster of not so standard computers, a cluster of high performance computers. Um, but anyway, you could, you, could stand, you could do a standard software approach. Okay. Advantages, this is cheap, it's flexible, it's easy. It's easy to make changes and relatively speaking, it's easier to debug than the other alternatives I'm going to talk about. Uh, but what's the problem? The problem is that it may not perform well. In fact, it won't perform well relative to the alternative below. So all these things are relative. It all depends to what you're comparing. Okay. Now, another alternative is to actually go out and fabricate custom hardware for your application. Uh, actually build a custom chip, also known as an application-specific integrated circuit, or ASIC. You may hear me mention ASIC Later in the talk, that's the, out, the acronym. So this is the flip side of the advantages and disadvantages. You get great performance because you've got a chip specialized to just what you're doing, um, but it's very expensive, especially in terms of NRE here means non-recurring engineering costs. So to fabricate a new chip, that could be millions of dollars. Uh, chips, and, and I'm drawing the distinction about non-recurring engineering costs because once you've fabricated the first chip, churning out the assembly line to produce many, many more, the cost per chip can actually be low. Um, but it's that initial cost that can be prohibited for all but um, the applications that enjoy the largest um, market share. Uh, it can really be prohibitive. Uh, it's completely inflexible. Once you've fabricated a chip, you can't change it. If you discover that you need to change it, you need to spin a whole new chip and incur those costs again. Uh, and it's hard to do. It brings in hardware design, which is another area. So <clears throat> you're either stuck with poor performance or you're stuck with something expensive, inflexible, and hard to do. Uh, so the short version of the talk is bummer. That's it. Uh, question is, can we do better than that? Answer, as always, is it depends. Or maybe. Okay, so here's a potential solution is reconfigurable hardware. What's reconfigurable hardware? Well, it's hardware that can act like any other hardware. It can be reconfigured to, to look like other hardware or to emulate other hardware. Uh, the most common example, the most popular example these days are field programmable gate arrays or FPGAs. Uh, 
So a lot of the other slides are going to refer to FPGA, and that's a standard for a reconfigurable, hard, for a reconfigurable hardware device, basically, an FPGA. So you can emulate custom hardware, but then you can reconfigure the device to emulate different custom hardware. So you're not stuck with the same level of inflexibility, and you can amortize the cost of this hardware over more different applications, potentially over many different applications. And in that sense, it's more software-like. Okay. Now, in terms of that flexibility, the sort of slogan for reconfigurable hardware, what uh, we like to claim is it's the best of both worlds. You get the performance of hardware and the flexibility of software. And the ideal picture would look like this, best of both worlds, not only in terms of performance versus flexibility, but in terms of everything I just mentioned on the previous slide. So on the runtime performance axis from slow to fast, it would be fast. On the development performance axis from expensive, inflexible, and hard, like application-specific integrated circuits, to cheap, flexible, and easy, we'd achieve the best of everything. And by the way, this trade-off here, the dichotomy between the first two things we looked at, application-specific hardware versus software. Uh, the way I labeled the axes here, the more I think about it, this is really the trade-off you're talking about, is what happens for development? So is it easier or hard to develop? Is it slow or fast to develop? Um, cheap or expensive to develop? Versus what happens at runtime? Is it slow or fast to run? Is it cheap or expensive to run? Uh, in terms of time, space, money, power consumption, etc. So view it as a runtime versus development trade-off. So do you get the best of both worlds? Well, no. But you still get something that might be interesting. What you get is something in between. So you may not escape this spectrum uh, between the custom chip and the software. You may not escape this line between them, but you get another possibility. You get at least a compromise in between them. And even getting a compromise between them can be valuable, can be very valuable, because the choice that we displayed on the first slide is way too stark for many applications. You may not actually have a good fit for software, and you certainly may not have a good fit for a custom chip, but your application may be a good fit for something in between. Now, another thing I wanted to mention about this slide is uh, for, first of all, as you can imagine, it's a pretty, it's a very abstract slide. And even if this exact spot meant something, even if this was quantitative, you're not always going to be exactly there. A reconfigurable solution could be just about anywhere on this graph. In fact, if you're not careful, you could get the worst of both worlds, or you could be just about any place on this graph. But this is kind of uh, what we can achieve here is some compromise between the two and a way to trade off along that compromise. Okay, okay. So, <clears throat> so I told you you could have a compromise along there. Is that interesting? Let's look first at some applications at a very high level in terms of what's possible to do here, what has been achieved so far, and this is just a very small sample of what's been achieved so far. Okay, uh, so Bayesian network learning, uh, this is a, a, an approach to causal discovery, which is one of the fields that we deal with in informatics. Uh, so there was this team by Asadi et al. They published a paper in 2008 where they reported a four orders of magnitude speed up compared to software for their Bayesian network learning application. Um, four orders of magnitude is nothing to sneeze at. So. This is an interesting report here, even if they are investing a lot to do this. That said, following up with papers that have happened since then, uh, the plot thickens, as I said. Same group, 2010, um, this time they went after optimizing the software implementation, coming up with a very heavily optimized parallel implementation of the software, and the gap went from four orders of magnitude to a factor of two. Um, nowhere near as much. But again, if you're looking at the trade-off between, oh, the software is really easy to do, this type of software, this parallel and this heavily optimized is maybe not so easy to do. 
Um, but it does drive home the point that it really depends to what you're comparing and also that the field of research is, of course, a moving target. Uh, if you say, well, you can do it better with reconfigurable computing, someone can find a way to do it better on a standard CPU or on something else, and it keeps going back and forth. Now, also, Linderman, who is actually part of the same team, so this is actually the same group of people, that same year, 2010, came up with an alternate system. This is using both FPGAs and graphics processing units, which are another form of non-conventional computing. Using those together, about the same performance as this other paper with FPGAs from 2010, but a fraction of the cost. So coming up with a better possibility there by mixing several implementations. Okay, application number two, more Bayesian network learning. Um, this was actually a paper that I was part of, and what we did here was we were looking to do a proof of concept for an approach to Bayesian network learning that was using particle swarm optimization. Uh, now, <clears throat> the approach that we took here, an initial approach, we figured, well, we'll just do it this way first and then we can improve from there, was basically pretty much implementing directly from the software. We weren't doing anything automatic to translate from the software to hardware, but basically using the software implementation as a reference and pretty much mimicking it in the way we design the reconfigurable hardware. Now, <clears throat> the existing software implementation was parallel, running on a cluster using message passing. It was used a uh, master-slave design, so you have one master and multiple slaves working together to implement this particle swarm optimization. The hardware implementation we came up with in this initial design was better by a factor of about two and a half per slave. So if you look at the evaluations per second per slave that we achieved, it's about a factor of two and a half better. What's the catch? The catch is that the parallel version that they ran, uh, that the, the group we were building off of, um, the baseline implementation that ran on the cluster was running on a cluster that had multiple computers and could support multiple slaves. And with the 10 slaves that they typically ran on their cluster, you put those together, we actually fall behind. So we did worse than the cluster implementation. Uh, not a very good place to be, but it is better per slave. It is better per dollar also. If you look at the cost of the FPGA uh, we were using compared to the cost of the cluster necessary to support the, the 10 slaves that they were doing, it was better per dollar, but still slower overall. Okay. Now, what's the pitfall here? We were using a direct translation from the software. Uh, there was essentially no parallelism, and the point, as I'll show in later slides, of doing reconfigurable hardware, or any hardware for that matter, the point really is parallelism. There was essentially no parallelism in this particular baseline implementation on the reconfigurable devices. For one thing, we could only fit one slave on this FPGA using our initial design, and within the slave, it was so directly translated from the software that it wasn't really taking advantage of fine-grained parallelism either. Um, so those are the main reasons why it didn't perform better overall. Okay, other applications. Sequencing, back to other people, Olson et al. In sequencing, looking at short read mapping and they compared an FPGA-based implementation versus BFAST and Bowtie, a favorite tool of some people in the audience, and they showed 250 times speed up versus the software implementation of BFAST, and about 30 times speed up versus Bowtie, and bonus, their version was able to align more reads than the other leading brand. So they actually got some more reads in there and at least one order of magnitude better performance, in one case, two orders of magnitude for this short read mapping. And there have been other successes in sequencing related uh, applications before as well. Um, proteomics. Okay. Um, Kalka et al. in 2012 reported three orders of magnitude speed up in the area of peptide mass fingerprinting. 
So there's potential here. I'd like to look at where is it coming from and also if there is all this potential, why hasn't it taken over the world yet? What are the, what are the challenges here? Okay, so where is it coming from? Uh, yeah, Yin. So in all the examples yeah. that you gave, uh, yeah. if you had a hardware-only implementation, mm -hmm. what is the difference there? So by hardware-only, in this case, do you mean not reconfigurable, like actually uh, spinning a chip? Right, so the difference with hardware-only, first of all, is what it takes to do it. The design, the design approach, at least the initial design approach, is, is quite similar because you're still designing hardware. Um, but then in terms of actually fabricating a chip also changes the back end of the design approach and means you've got to fabricate it, which is a huge upfront cost. But, right, what is the speed difference there? Uh, so qualitatively, you're still not going to perform as well because there is overhead to the reconfigurability as well. So is um, it a one time or is it, you know, Right, from a, from a qualitative value. standpoint. Just in general. Right. I, I know, you know, any type yeah. of benchmarking, there's always right. a zillion Yeah, I mean, the, it, it depends because it depends on the application and some reconfigurable designs are better at overcoming that overhead. Uh, for example, there's overhead in making it flexible, but if you do runtime reconfiguration to make use of the flexibility during one application, then you can actually recoup that, that overhead, so to speak. Um, you're gonna be, I'm gonna say there's another order of magnitude pot potentially there going from an FPGA to an actual application specific integrated circuit. Uh, but that's, it depends. Yeah. Um, okay, so whether you're doing that, whether you're doing the actual application specific integrated circuit, or whether you're actually doing re reconfigurable hardware, you've got a lot of the same potential advantages. Most, most of these apply to both. Uh, the thing about hardware is you've got a lot of fine-grained parallelism available. Um, in fact, it's been said that in hardware, parallelism comes free. It's the sequencing that's hard, whereas in software, it's the other way around. Sequencing comes for free. Uh, it's the parallelism that's hard. You've got a lot, almost an arbitrary amount of fine-grained parallelism available for you, um, really limited by the application and most important on your ability to find out how to extract it from the application. Uh, you can deploy basically all the silicon to the task at hand and you can tailor the bit widths, essentially how many digits you're storing for each number separately for each variable or each unit within your system to get, uh, I mean, that, that's in a way part of deploying the silicon to the task at hand, is you can optimize bit width separately for different, um, different numbers and different units. You can match the physical layout of the circuit to the communication patterns necessary. Put things next to each other that really should be next to each other for your application and potentially avoid the memory bottleneck that's very common in a standard CPU approach. You have all of the processing power segregated in one place and all of the memory in another place. Often the limiting factor is the bottleneck between the processor and the memory. FPGAs tend to have little memory sprinkled among a sea of, of processing power. So potentially you can avoid the bottleneck there. Okay, but what's the catch? Well, there are a lot of catches here. Um, one catch, on an FPGA, the clock rate in a given fabrication technology, so if you look at a given uh, generation of FPGAs side by side with the simultaneous generation of CPUs, typically the clock rate that can be supported in an FPGA is only one-tenth that of a, uh, of a CPU. Okay. The other problem is, since hardware design, 
and this includes reconfigurable hardware design, is a completely different way of looking at things, then people are going to want to justify that investment. People are going to want like a 10 times improvement in runtime performance. These things are going in opposite directions. So to over, overcome that, you may need to find about a hundred, a factor of a hundred or a hundred things that you can do in parallel. You need to find like a hundred way parallelism available. Uh, that's a tall order for a lot of applications. Okay. Uh, the other challenge, especially if you're coming from a background of software design or any background other than hardware design, is that you have to change the way you're thinking. Uh, to really take advantage of FPGAs, you have to think like a hardware designer, even though this is kind of pseudo hardware. You have to think not only in terms of time, but in terms of space. You have to think about how to arrange your application spatially, how to have units that you interconnect in space and how that's going to work. And that is a different way of thinking. So I have a couple of slides here with uh, some block diagrams slash schematics on them. The idea of these slides is neither to actually explain these in detail or tell you how those applications work, nor is the goal to frighten you away. Rather, the, detail, the goal is at a very high level to give you some feel for what do I mean when I say you have to think like a hardware designer. Uh, so one thing that I mean is you have to think about how to arrange the computation spatially. You have to think about the way I'm going to handle this application is I'm, and this, by the way, was a sequencing application, uh, de novo genome assembly, in fact. Uh, I'm going to arrange a pipeline of computation, and I'm going to have information flowing through this pipeline in the following way. And the pipeline will be made up of these units, and I'll detect when um, the next unit is full. Uh, you have to think about how to arrange the computation like that. Um, by the way, these guys were doing de novo genome assembly, and they got a 13 times uh, speed up there. Another example of thinking spatially and thinking like a hardware designer. Um, so this application, uh, this was for a Smith-Waterman algorithm in hardware. And you see they're showing the application at work on the left, and then they're showing the arrangement that they came up with and they're actually designing a tile that they're going to place on the FPGA and make multiple copies of this tile. And um, they're actually showing where information is going to come in from the left and from the top and go out to the right and down to below such that these tiles can be literally tiled. Uh, and this is both, it's the advantage of hardware design and it's also the challenge of hardware design. The cool part is you get to think this way and you get to design tiles that actually fit with the way the algorithm is working. Um, the challenge is that you have to, to take all the advantage of the hardware. And it seems like a natural on this figure given the way the algorithm is working, but it's not a natural transformation if what you're coming from is software that did this by nested for loops and trying to figure out how to translate that into a tile like this it's a completely different way of thinking. Um, so that, that, that's uh, just to give you an idea of the type of diagrams that you start thinking about as you think about hardware approaches to these algorithms. Um, okay. Another challenge with reconfigurable computing, uh, the relative costs of different pieces are different. So what I mean is, What's going to be an expensive thing to do in terms of runtime? Um, what's going to be an inexpensive thing to do? Where are you, and what's, yeah, yeah. Uh, so relative costs. One example of that is representing numbers in floating point notation. Um, think, if, if you're used to programming in C, think floats or reels um, versus fixed point notation. So even if you're not used to programming in C, just getting back to numbers, what's floating point? Floating point is basically scientific notation. So you're storing numbers in terms of a mantissa and an exponent, uh, whereas fixed point is you store a certain number of digits to the left of the decimal point or the binary point and a certain number of digits to the right of the 
the decimal point or the binary point. Floating point is good for controlling relative error uh, because numbers are concentr the, the possible numbers you can represent since all digital representations are really only choosing, can represent a finite number of numbers. Those numbers are concentrated around zero in floating point, whereas fixed point spreads them out evenly across the number line, so they're um, controlling absolute error. It turns out one weakness of FPGAs is they're not very good at doing floating point. You can build a floating point unit on an FPGA, but it tends to be very expensive. You can easily wind up taking up most of your FPGA just implementing the floating point unit, only to find it doesn't perform very well. So FPGAs are much better at fixed point numbers. Problem is, a lot of scientific applications are written assuming floating point representation. Now, some of them are written that way because they really need it. They really need those features of concentrating higher resolution around zero. A lot of them are written that way not because they really need it, but just because it's convenient for a programmer to write it that way. If you're going to try to implement an application on an FPGA and the application is doing all its calculations in floating point, one of the things you may want to do is look at that and say, can I first convert this application to used fixed point arithmetic? And if so, what are the implications? Is that a good fit for the application? Is it a bad fit for the application? Uh, and a good thing to do, and um, I've, I've done this on, on one of the applications, is actually study before you even try to build the hardware, actually do simulations to see if I do it in fixed point with this many bits, what kind of error am I going to see? So that, that's, that's another challenge coming from the relative cost being different, which may need to change your thinking. OK, so I just told you you have to turn yourself inside out and change your way of thinking. And it's much harder. It's uh, less flexible than software. It's not quick and dirty. So. Some of you in the audience may be thinking, oh, come on, isn't there just a button I can press that will just automatically take my software and I press the button and it converts it into an FPGA implementation and puts it on an FPGA? Uh, yes, but uh, there are lots of catches. There are lots of systems that claim to do this, by the way, or at least uh, several systems that claim to do this, by the way. Um, MATLAB has their own tools to try to translate MATLAB code onto an FPGA. FPGA vendors also have tools to translate MATLAB code onto an FPGA. Uh, there are many efforts to compile standard programming languages or extensions of standard programming languages and produce hardware out of them and put them on an FPGA. Um, my opinion from what I've seen so far you get what you pay for, and I don't mean in terms of the money for the tool. I mean in terms of the effort to turn your way of thinking around. Um, I've seen two main problems with these automated systems so far. And they're an area of lots of ongoing research, by the way. But so far, the problems are as follows. They look like they're push button at first, but they're not really push button. Uh, because Say they say, we're going to take your favorite language, whether it's MATLAB or C or whatever, and translate it to an FPGA. It turns out in the fine print that we only support a subset of the commands or a subset of the constructs of that language. No, OK, I'll avoid those. Well, it turns out that that subset is very restrictive. So I've been in this situation before where by the time we were done getting it through the tool, the MATLAB code looked nothing like the MATLAB code we started with. And making those transformations was hard enough that for hardware designers like us, it would have been easier to throw out the automated tool and just design the hardware from scratch. Uh, so that, that can happen sometimes, that it's not so push button because the subset of the language it supports is so restrictive. The other problem is that you're typically not going to get the performance you would out of a handcrafted design. And often much worse, especially if the starting point for the automatic translation tool was a very serial language like standard C code, where the parallelism in the application has already been hidden from the tool. It's very hard for the tool to overcome that. Um, so it may not be as easy as, as you think using these tools. And 
you're probably not going to get as good results as if you actually go the extra mile to think like a hardware designer. Okay, so conclusions based on that so far. Great potential, hard to realize this potential. Um, and I kind of said these things already, but to recap, direct translation from software, from a software way of, of doing things is problematic. And there are a couple of styles of direct, or mechanisms of direct translation. One of them is you're designing hardware in a hardware description language from scratch, but you're looking at the software while you do it. Uh, and you're looking at that software very closely. And say you've got C code over here, and you see this line of the C code, and you try to figure out what's the corresponding line in my hardware description language to do it. And you go step by step by step. That's manual. You're designing hardware as you go, by hand, so to speak. So you might say, ah, oh, it's a handcrafted solution. It'll work really well. But you're, too, you're following the software too much. Uh, that direct translation is unlikely to work well in terms of reaping all the benefits of, of a reconfigurable device. Other thing that's not likely to reap all those benefits are automatic translation systems, although those are improving. Okay. What's more likely to reap the full benefits is to rethink your application and the algorithms for that application and the way of implementing those algorithms starting over to find an algorithm that's actually a better, so, so sometimes changing the algorithm so it's a better fit for hardware. Or if not changing the algorithm itself, at least changing the very first level of implementation under that algorithm to be a better fit for the hardware, at least thinking about what would be a better fit rather than translating directly. Uh, and the other thing is what we really need is close collaboration between the domain expert, in other words, application level expert. So if I'm trying to accelerate sequencing, I need somebody who's in sequencing to work with for that. I'm not going to be able to do it myself. And vice versa, um, you need on the collaboration team to really take advantage of the FPGA, someone who is a hardware expert or an FPGA expert or a reconfigurable hardware expert like me. So work with me so, because uh, I think only with this collaboration can you really do well because otherwise you're dependent on these, these automated solutions which aren't really there yet. Um, maybe they will be some way. Uh, questions so far? Okay. Uh, so aren't, there, uh, aren't there some standard design paths that, that for example, I'm not a uh, hardware expert in there? Yes. So the, the so the question is, are there are there common design patterns to take advantage of reconfigurable computing, and is there a place to find these common design patterns, like a book that'll that'll tell you about them? Um, yes, and yes. So uh, and I I can point you to some good books on this. Um, uh, Hoke and Dehan's textbook on reconfigurable computing, which uh, I believe the title is Reconfigurable Computing, uh, is an excellent source. And it covers, in addition to other things like case studies, it covers exactly that in terms of design patterns. Um, so your question actually had a, a couple of types of design patterns, I think. One is patterns of the general approach to the application that tend to work well. And that, by the way, is probably the most important one for the high-level approach. Um, and yes, there are many patterns like that. Uh, I've touched on it by showing this slide from these guys over here. Um, systolic arrays uh, or cellular arrays, that's a pattern that tends to work in hardware. Can you come up with a way to have a little processing unit where you make a tiled pattern of these things, and each one only has to talk to its neighbors. That's the type of thing that works well, on, or has potential to work well on a reconfigurable device. 
Uh, pipelining is another big one in this picture. We see a similar idea, but it's a linear structure, a pipeline there. Um, data flow architecture, where you focus on data operations and each one is only waiting for when are its inputs ready and then it does some little computation and produces its output, working in terms of data flow graphs um, to do data flow computation. That's another example of a design pattern. Um, and there are, there are a lot of those. So yes, people have looked at these. They're coming up with more of them. Yes, there are, there are books that collect these. Uh, the other part of your question was, I think, design pattern in the, more in the small, which is, say your application needs to multiply two matrices. As somebody looked at, what's the best way to multiply matrices in an FPGA? Um, and yes, people have, have looked at that too. Um, there are, in this case, there's even vendor support because there are um, the equivalent of libraries in software. So there are intellectual property cores and libraries of those intellectual property cores. Uh, and uh, some of these are provided by the very vendors of the FPGA. So they'll have a little tool called Core Generator, which says, I want a fast Fourier transform unit. And it says, okay, here's one for you as a black box, plunk it down here, and now hook your stuff up to it. So the good news is you don't have to worry about re-implementing Fast Fourier Transform yourself, and presumably they've got, done a good job of putting it on hardware. Um, the potential bad news is at that point, uh, you, just, you have to hook up to their particular box, and you have to think about hooking up to that box instead of thinking behaviorally. Uh, but yes, there are examples of that and way to use those. So you're not completely on your own. So a, a, a related question. So this uh, cellular type uh, pattern mm -hmm. that you showed on the, on the uh, just now. Oh, yeah, uh, that guy. For the alignment. Yes. Uh, that sort of fits very, very closely in how, in the optimal uh, design for GPU applications. Yes. Uh, so, uh, and you've mentioned GPUs before. So, so where, uh, how do they compare uh, in, in maybe for problems that uh, similar similar to that this time? Uh, is there an, an advantage in, in uh, spend, arguably spending more time uh, to design mm -hmm. in, uh, on a PGA rather than going to uh, GPU solutions? Right, right. So the question was about graphics processing units, which I, I mentioned briefly but mostly avoided uh, during the talk. So. What Alex is asking about with graphics processing units is that graphics cards, which were developed for computers to drive the graphics processing chain um, and to process graphics, uh, mostly driven by the demand for video games, um, and which became very, very powerful. And then people realized that actually all that power and all the parallelism that they exploited for graphics could be exploited for other applications. And so people talk now about general purpose graphics processing units, so they're, they're not just for graphics anymore. And it turns out that as if we were already having trouble selling people on, on uh, FPGAs and reconfigurable computing, it turns out that a lot of the same applications that traditionally were where FPGA is shown uh, can be done as well or almost as well or even better in GPUs, which brings your question, you know, why, why would we bother with FPGAs? Uh, <clears throat> there are a few answers. One is, in a lot of cases, you don't need to. In a lot of cases, it would make more sense to use a GPU. And the difference there in terms, and Alex was getting at the ease of one versus the other, GPUs are still a totally different, well, they're still a different way of thinking compared to standard software. And a lot of the same rules apply when I said you can't just take your standard software and just cram it into, in this case, a GPU. You have to rethink how you're doing it. Same story applies with GPUs. The difference is it's still software, so you don't have to get out of software and hardware. The other difference is because GPUs were already everywhere for video games, there's a lot more support. And so suddenly there's a lot more people supporting it um, and better tools supporting it for general purpose computing as well. Um, so in a lot of cases, that does make more sense, and you have a, there's a lot of similarity there. Uh, 
there are cases where, and I think the field is still sort of working this out, you know, for what applications would an FPGA make more sense and for what does a GPU make sense. I mentioned the fixed point versus floating point issue. If your application really needs floating point, you'll be better off with a GPU because they're much better at it than FPGAs are. If you can get away with recasting it to fixed point, so applications that can use fixed point, in particular of small word widths, you may do better with an FPGA. The other difference is, and I didn't mention this much, but the other cost when it comes, or an other cost when it comes to runtime is not just slow versus fast, but the question of power consumption. So how much computing can you do per joule of energy, for instance? Uh, now, the first reaction when I mention power consumption, the first reaction I get from most people is, what do I care about power consumption? I only care how fast it goes. Um, the thing is, behind the scenes, you may be impacted by power consumption in ways you don't realize. Often the limiting factor for what MCIT will allow us to put in their data center is not how physically large it is or even how, or a limiting factor for us is how much it costs to buy the stuff in the first place, but sometimes the limiting factor is how much heat it dissipates. And so we could give you better performance if we could put a bigger cluster there, but we can't put a bigger cluster there because it consumes too much heat. Sometimes that's the limiting factor. Or sometimes these things, you, you simply can't implement something because it would take too much heat. Uh, it's an even bigger concern for the people who are designing the FPGAs and the CPUs and the GPUs, but ultimately it impacts the end user as well. In terms of computation per watt, FPGAs still far outshine GPUs. Uh, and that's also some of these same papers that I was showing, they, they do both those comparisons. So it's another it depends. But yeah, in a lot of the scenario where before I would have said without question go FPGA, now I have to say, well, probably go GPU for that one. Um, but there are still situations where I'd go with an FPGA. Oh, the other thing I wanted to mention there is in terms of all this better support now for designing for a GPU, what people are starting to look at now, since a lot, there's a lot of overlap in what parallelism you have to extract and, so, and what you need to pay attention to, People are now looking at taking CUDA, which is a design development, development environment for GPUs from NVIDIA, and also OpenCL, an open source version, and adapting backends for those to target FPGAs. Um, so it all, it all connects. So when you're writing an application, if you can get your application in like, you know, a functional program or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, is there sort of a programming paradigm in software where you can sort of have better guarantees that one day you can actually turn it into a you know, GPU or FPGA application? And is it the, right. is it the functional programming paradigm in that sort of thing? Uh, right, so func functional programming would help. So the question I think broadly is, if, if you want to keep your options open to improve your chances that someday there'll be a good FPGA application for this, um, or if I could extend your question a little bit to improve the chances that an automated tool will be able to translate to a good FPGA implementation of this, what programming paradigm should you choose? And the proposal was functional programming. That would be a good one. Um, bottom line is the more parallelism can be captured in the initial language itself um, or in your specification of, of the language. So, the problem with starting from straight C code, at first it looks attractive because C is closer to hardware. But the problem with it is the programmer has already committed at that point to doing everything serially and has already committed to lots of details about how to do it. Your odds are much better if you have a higher level programming language that just says here's what needs to happen, never mind how. Especially if it's one where you can either hide whether it will be implemented serially or parallelly, or better yet, specifically say, I want to do this in parallel. Those are the languages that work well. Uh, yeah, you mentioned Haskell. There are, some, there are some tools that translate from Haskell or extended subsets of Haskell into FPGAs. Um, also, object-oriented programming can be nice because objects tend to be, 
these units that have interfaces that talk to other units so you can place objects onto an FPGA. Um, and the attractive thing about MATLAB, even though so far the automated tools I've dealt with I haven't been impressed with, but the potential with MATLAB is that it already encourages the programmer to write things in terms of matrix operations instead of loops or nested loops. So the way you're coding is saying, do, do this to all the elements of this vector or to all the elements of this matrix or do some high level operation on matrices. That gives more opportunities available to a tool or to a human for that matter who's trying to recast it um, as a hardware implementation. Yes. <clears throat> Question. There are only two vendors for, for FPGAs. Altera and Cylinx. Altera and Cylinx are the two biggest vendors. Yeah. Are they getting better? What is the roadmap? I mean, with all the uh, things that you said, all the areas of, uh, of improvement they can have, mm -hmm. are they getting better? Uh, yes, they're getting better. Um, they're, they're certainly trying. Um, one of the ways in which they're getting better is going more aggressively after these tools that work from a higher level of abstraction. Um, and the, historically what's happened there is not that they're developing themselves, but that they're watching what other people do and then acquiring um, companies or spin-offs from academia to do these automatic translation tools um, from MATLAB or from, instead of hardware description languages that work at a very low level, which is traditionally how you make hardware, um, more behavioral languages or system level languages uh, like System Verilog. So they're working this question of tools aggressively because they know that that's really limiting adoption, uh, but it's just still, it's an open question uh, where it, how much progress, how soon there will be. But yes, they're getting better. Related question. Yeah. Uh, Wall Street has been using FPGA for a very long time. But this the state of the economy probably is due to that. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there anything to learn from those guys about black boxes and those low latency trading? Right, yes. So um, that's been another big application area for for reconfigurable computing and FPGAs has been the financial sector uh, where you have to process trades really, really fast to make more money. Uh, question is, is there stuff to be learned from them? The answer is yes. Uh, one of the things one can learn from them is design patterns, as Alex was asking about, what, um, where approaches tend to, to work well. Um, there are, so certainly some of the challenges are the same and you can learn from how they solve those challenges. Some of the challenges are different though. One of the nice things about financial stuff is that there's less stuff that really needs floating point. So I talked about floating point versus fixed point. Uh, you're more likely to be dealing with um, fixed point type quantities when you're dealing with financial stuff. Um, so, so not all the challenges are the same, but, but yeah, some of them are. Um, for scientific applications, some things are better suited for FPGAs in terms of uh, having a lot of parallelism that, that you can extract. But yes, there's stuff to learn from that. Other questions? Can I ask the last yes. one? Yes. a follow-up from other questions there. Yeah. With technologies like grid computing, and then you mentioned the GPU and FPGA, mm -hmm. what, what would be a good reference to try to get the right mix of technology for a given problem? Ah, uh, okay. So, so what would be the right reference to yeah, get the so right mix of technology? To, uh, if it has a problem, what would be the right mix of technology in order to attack a specific problem? Right. You um, have to tailor probably from the Yeah, yeah. So there, there are. There's, there are certainly texts that look at that. There are general purpose texts in high performance computing, which since there, there are a lot of, there is a lot of interest these days in mixed architectures, you'll see uh, discussions in those. And I would have to, I mean, I, I, let's see, I'm trying to think if I have a reference off the top of the, my head. Actually, I do have one book here that I think covers some of that stuff, so I can show you that. Um, I can show you that afterwards. Um, 
Also, some of the papers have looked at that. I mean, this, this is a research field of hardware software co-design and heterogeneous design. So there are papers that look at that too. And trying to, to find which one that was. Yes, so this Linderman and company, their paper is a hybrid system. So they were looking at, now that's just for one application, but they were addressing this question of, I've got standard CPUs, I've got GPUs, I've got FPGAs, uh, what's the right mix? Should I just use one of them? Should I use multiple ones? And if I divide up my application among multiple ones, how should I do it? They were looking at that in that paper for that particular application. So, and by the way, a lot of this is going to a mixture, both in terms of given application, do you use a mixture of devices, and also in devices. You get CPUs incorporating aspects of FPGAs and GPUs incorporating aspects of FPGAs and the other way around. There are FPGAs that have embedded CPUs on them uh, to get some CPU advantages. One could also argue that with multi-core CPUs, you've already got some of the advantages that you have on an FPGA of more parallelism and more mixture of processing with memory. You could argue that in the limit, as you get more and more cores on a CPU, what you've really got is a type of FPGA. So the, the architectures are converging as, as well. So you have a mixture in that sense also. Stratos. So far. How about using FPGAs to encapsulate and encrypt an algorithm? So I'm not so much concerned about the speed, as long as mm -hmm. the FPGA performs reasonably in that area of speed. Mm -hmm. But if I have an algorithm, proper time, I don't want to give you the code. I would rather have an FPGA that can give you the and say, here it is, kind of mm -hmm. Do they have an application like that? So, yes, so the question, question is, can I, su suppose I'm worried about piracy and I want to give you or sell you, probably, the ability to run my application, but I don't want to give you the code for it, um, is an FPGA one way to go? Uh, in general, yes, people do that. People do that with hardware in general. It's probably even easier to hide it if it's a real application-specific integrated circuit. If you give somebody an actual chip as opposed to an FPGA, it's even more hidden. As with many things, the FPGAs, though, represent a compromise. Uh, one of the problems with FPGAs in this aspect is that the configuration of the FPGA itself is stored in a bit stream. Uh, so there's even research on encrypting the bit streams and having it only decrypted by the FPGA itself. Uh, there's another thing in the mix here which hinders research in other areas is that the big vendors like Xilinx and Altera, their bitstream formats are proprietary. So there's research, research that could otherwise deal with minute manipulations to the bit strings are hindered by that. Um, however, trying, what you're trying to do of hide the source code, so to speak, could actually be helped by that. Although there's the usual caveat that security by obscurity is not very reliable, um, but for, first, first step in that direction. But, but yes, people have, have looked at that. Thank you.